Hello and welcome to another video. In this video I'm going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus, part 1 and part 2. Now both of them are together, but I want to start with the very basic root of the whole integration and differentiation thing, how they are connected. So the fundamental theorem of calculus is what actually tells us that there is a connection and what the connection is between differentiation and what we call integration, but at the beginning is referred to as anti-differentiation. So when you hear the word anti-differentiation, you're saying it looks like it is against differentiation or the reverse of differentiation. So whatever you integrate, if you differentiate it, you're supposed to go back to the original. And whatever you differentiate, if you integrate it, you're supposed to go back to the original. So let us see what the concept says at the beginning and let's see what part two tells us to do. Let's get into the video. So what exactly does the fundamental theorem of calculus say? Especially part one, which is where we're going to start. Well, it simply says that if f is continuous on a closed interval a to b, okay, it's a continuous function, that means it is differentiable over that interval, which simply means it has a derivative as you go from a to b, whatever point you pick between a and b, there's always a derivative, I mean there's always a dy dx, okay, so we're saying if f is continuous on this interval, then we can say that there is a function which we call f of x defined as the integral from a, the beginning, along the path to b. So we're just saying any point you pick between a and b, which could be, we just represent it as x. Remember a is a constant, b is a constant, that's the end of it. We know what b is if we have a defined um, interval. But in between a and b, it could be any value of x, okay? So we're just going to pick that of a function well, this function that is continuous over the interval, let's use t as the variable. If you integrate this with respect to t, we are saying that there is a function called capital F of x, which you're going to get when you integrate this function over this interval. However, the beautiful part of it is that if you differentiate this function such that you take df dx, it's going to be the derivative of the right-hand side also, definitely, which is going to be ddx of this expression, which is a to the, um, the limit from a to x of this function f of t dt. So you're just integrating both. Remember, this was just the definition of what this is. And it is the integral you get if you take a continuous function over a closed interval and you integrate it, okay? That answer you get, if you go back and differentiate it, your answer is just gonna be you taking this x and putting it here. It's gonna be f of x. And that's it. <laughs> well, sometimes the definition of a concept could be very confusing and you go, what is this? That's why I put these questions here. As soon as I start using them, you're going to go, oh, it's this easy. Now, that is part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It just says that the derivative of an integral over uh, a limit, lower and upper limit, the derivative of an integral is the upper limit of the function. Just look at that. The derivative, you see, we did not use this a, we just used the upper limit. You just replace this here, okay? So if you look at this, you start looking at the answer, okay? You start looking at the answer to this one, that if I differentiate y, if I look for dy dx in this problem, I just need to take this x and replace the t. My answer is gonna be x squared. That's it. What about the one? Well, don't worry, the second, part of the FTC explains why the one is not important because you're gonna see soon. But I just want you to see the concept right now that this is all you need to know. Take this letter here, plug it in here. Make sure what is here is a letter and what is here is not a letter, okay? So make sure, I said letter, well, that's a lot of English. Now this is a variable and this is a constant, okay? Now that's how this theorem works. You have to have a constant under and you have to have a variable on top for the first part of the FTC to be relevant. If both of them are constants, well, you have to work it out. So let's go to part B, okay? The second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this part is, I'm gonna write here, this is part one, part one, okay? So what does part two say? Well, you already know part two because you've used it before, or maybe you haven't used it, but I think you've used it. So let me write it here because it's not a major thing. The second part just tells you that, um, 
if you integrate a function between two constants a and b of f of x, okay, remember this definition, we'll go here, we could say that is f of x, so dx, so let's do this. Let's write it this way, that let's f of x. Now we are not using variables anymore and we are not differentiating. What will be the value of this? Well, it's just saying it will be f of the upper limit minus f of the lower limit. So it's always the upper limit minus the lower limit. So this way, this is the second part, which we all use every time we do integration because you just integrate and you plug in the top part minus you plug in the bottom part after integrating and you get your answer. But the first part is the part that is a little tricky and most people just skip it and move on. But if you understand this, you'll be able to solve all of these problems on the board and we'll be fine. Now let's get into using the FTC to solve all these four problems. Let's take the first question in this. So the first question says, why is the integral from one to x of t squared to t? Okay, well, you know that after you integrate this, what you're going to have will be f of the upper limit minus f of 1. Well, what is f? The capital F will be what you get when you integrate the function. Let's assume we don't know how to integrate. But this is what you have, and that's going to be your y. But what about dy dx? You see, dy dx is going to be the derivative of this, which is going to be uh, ddx of f of x minus ddx of f of 1. Now remember that f of 1 is the function in which we've substituted 1, so you're going to get an actual constant as your answer. Well, the derivative of a constant is 0, and the derivative of this, according to the part 1 of the fundamental theorem of calculus, is just taking this and plugging it here. So it's going to be x squared minus 0, which is x squared. So I went through this process so I can explain to you that it does not matter what is here as long as it's a constant. So if it's a constant, you don't need to show all of this because this is the only part that's important. Take the upper limit and plug it in here. That's it. So remember, you don't have to do this. Don't do it. Just take the top part, the upper limit, because it's a variable. Plug it in here, and you have x squared as the derivative of the integral. Anti-differentiation. Let's go to example two. Okay, for example two... It's just like example one. It's just that what we have is we have the lower limit being the variable and the upper limit being the constant. Now, what you want to do to make work easy or possible to apply the first, the part one of FTC is to flip the variables. But according to part two, because you know we're subtracting, if you change the positions, because subtraction is not commutative, so remember that you're going to have y will be equal to f of zero minus f of x. After we integrate, that's what we're going to get. But now we're trying to change this so that it goes to this side and this comes this way. Well, the easiest way to do that is to put a minus sign and then say we're going to have f of x minus f of 0. This way, we have not changed anything. What we've just done is we, we, we're trying to make things work nicely for us. Just so you see that, you put a negative sign. And what does that mean here? Well, I'm going to rewrite this function, put a negative sign, and flip these two. That's the only thing that we need to alter or adjust. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to write negative and flip these two. This is going to be 0 now. I have x here. You have 3t dt. That's what your new y is. So let's take the derivative, and then you're going to have dy dx is equal to, at this point, it's going to be, what do we have? Well, it's going to be negative. And because the bottom is a constant, the lower limit, and the upper limit is a variable, we take the variable down into the function. That's 3x. And that's it. Let's go to number 4. Now, if you check this one out, yeah, the variable, it's not a variable, it's a function, okay? This is not a variable, this is a function, because I know what, what the variable 2 was a function, but this is not just x, it is x squared, or something is happening to x. Now, if something is happening to x, you have to apply the chain rule to it, because what we want is just x. So it's like you having cosine x squared. If you differentiate cosine x squared, well, you have to first differentiate cosine, and then you differentiate what is inside. So this is what we're going to treat as what is inside, and the chain rule will apply. So in this case, we just have to say that dy dx will be equal to, we still do our replacement. We're going to go here and replace t with whatever is on top, which is going to be t. So that will be um, x squared, but we're going to raise it to the third power because we're replacing t with the upper limit. But because this is not just a variable, we have to apply 
the chain rule. Now the chain rule will be the derivative of this. You see, it's going to be the derivative of the function times the derivative of the inside. Well, the inside now will be ddx, ddx of x squared. Another way to make this clean so you understand the concept. Remember, we only need a variable on top, not a function of the variable. So let me show you another way you can do what you call um, the chain rule using the u substitution. So let's see this. So because this is not just a function, you're going to say let u be equal to x squared. Okay? That's all you need. Let u be equal to x squared. So we're going to write this function again. You have y is now equal to the integral from 2 to u of t cubed dt. Well, remember what we're looking for is dy dx. So let's take dy dx of this. Well, dy dx will be equal to... Uh, but this is not x. <laughs> Remember, we're looking for dy dx, but what we have right now is u and t. There's no x at all. So for you to get dy dx, remember the chain rule, dy dx equals dy du times du dx. So that's what we're doing, multiplied by du dx. So what do we do here? What is dy du? Well, dy du is the fundamental theorem of calculus that says dy du from here, dy du is just take this u and replace this one. So I'm going to say this is equal to u cubed multiplied by du dx. What's du dx? Well, we can tell that du dx equals 2x. So we can put 2x here. So our final answer here will be equal to 2x u cubed. That's our dy dx. But what is u? u is x squared. So let's go back and rewrite this. This is going to be 2x times x squared raised to power 3. And that tells us that our final answer is 2x times x to the 6th, which is 2x to the 7th. <laughs> Interesting, 2x to the 7th. This was the function, the original function, original function that was integrated. So you see how the answer is a little different from what we've got, what we thought. So this is how this goes, okay? Remember, you have to apply the chain rule if the upper limit is a function of x or a function of the variable you're using. Okay, so that's our dy dx. So let's take question number four, this one. You see, this one is a little different because it has a function on top and a function under. What you're going to do? So as you can see for this example, we have a variable in the bottom and we have a function on top. It's a more complicated situation. But remember that we're dealing with an interval from A to B. So what has happened is we have picked two points in the middle. It's possible that this is the beginning or the ending, but we're not sure. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this point is point X and this point is cosine of X. And in between point X and cosine of X, um, we're going to take our reference from here to A and then to B. And then we know that there's going to be a gap between these two, which is what we're looking for. So why don't we rewrite this expression this way? We can actually say that y is the integral from x to a point halfway. Remember, we're going to the right. So we're starting from x, and we're going to get to a point. We call it a, or you can call it 0. Actually, let's just use 0. And then you go from 0 to cosine x. Now, does it mean that x is less than cosine x? We don't know, but it's not important. OK, it will always work itself out. So let's just assume you're going from x to 0 of this function, dt. Then you're going to add the second part of it, OK, which will be you're going now from 0 to cosine x. So you, it's like, just look at this. Just assume that the middle here will be 0. So you go from x to 0 and from 0 to cosine x. So this is now going to be the integral from 0 to cosine x t dt. Now we can treat these the way we have treated the other ones. Now what do you remember about this? Remember we cannot apply the concept unless the variable is on top. So we have to first switch this. Remember. So let's switch this now. This is going to be the integral with a negative sign from 0 to x. So we have to put a negative sign because we flipped the limit of t dt plus this one is no problem because we have the constant in the bottom. That is 0 cosine x of t dt. Now, let's apply it. 
So this is our y. So what will dy dx be? Well, dy dx is going to be, just take this x and replace the t. That's all. But remember, there's a negative sign. So we have negative x. And we're done with this first part. Let's go to the second part. The second part is take the function on top and plug it in here. You're going to get cosine t. Oh, it's cosine x, rather. That's what we have, cosine x. But because this is a function of x, you have to differentiate cosine x and multiply this. If we differentiate cosine x, what do we get? We get negative sine x. So you'll see that finally what we have is negative x minus sine x cosine x. That's your dy dx. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning have stopped living. Bye-bye.